Well, welcome everybody uh, to the first of a five-part series that we'll be doing uh, on a monthly basis at the first Thursday of every month, uh, looking at practice management with IFNH. And for those of you who are not familiar with IFNH, we're a nonprofit foundation uh, that supports uh, uh, the work of Dr. Lee and the Lee Foundation. We're the caretakers of the Lee Foundation, and uh, also. If you've gone on our website, you'll notice that we also have a lot of the old books and uh, educational material that looked at whole food nutrition. Today, uh, I will be one of the speakers. My name is John Brady. Uh, I'm the director of the uh, foundation, and Dr. Ernie Caldwell will be the other one. Uh, so I'd like you to actually... Uh, Get your uh, pen or a pencil and a pad of paper and be ready to take some notes if you need to. Uh, I always find that I never, I never can remember what I want to say at the end when there is a question and answer period. And so at the end there will be a, a question and answer period for everybody. And, uh, uh, but today uh, we'll be looking at clinical tools. And, you know, the pharmaceutical companies have been telling us uh, uh, that, you know, they have the newest, or telling, I should say, telling the patients that they have the newest and greatest way of, uh, and this new breakthrough of getting people well and saving their lives. It doesn't do much for their pocketbook, I have to admit, but uh, it. Uh, and or the side effects that go along with it that upset the body chemistry. And we all have had a probably a uh, representative from a medical supply company tell us that they have this new great device that uh, has a great billing code and it's going to make us a lot of money. Or maybe even a speaker uh, at a seminar we <laughs> went to recently that uh, – when we get all finished with it, we find that, again, we walk out with a, you know, little sheet of paper and tells us what the protocol is going to be and what product we need to buy. And the fact is that successful practice are really built around getting people well. And you don't get people well unless you take care of some basic things and recognize some basic things. Hmm. Our physiology hasn't really changed in the last thousand years. Uh, Dr. Price, if any of you uh, aren't aware of him, I would suggest uh, looking up Weston Price and finding out a little more about him. You can find it on our website. Price did a wonderful study on primitive people, and one of the things he showed was that disease happens when you have processed foods. And it happens when you change those diets of people to things that offend their body chemistry. And processed foods are one of the major things. Dr. Lee uh, and uh, those pioneers tried to tell us that over and over and over again. What was their bad message? Well, the basic body chemistry only changes when you consume large amounts of white sugar and refined carbohydrates. Now, today we have a little different group of patients. We realize that there's, you know, the issues of bad oils or food colorings and additives that are bad, and, uh, synthetically manufactured foods or engineered foods, heavy metals and pollutants that all can poison the body. But we have somewhat control over that, and we can control that and help our patients understand that by really helping them to understand that lifestyle and diet are majorly important. So, you know, what do we do to make that happen? How do we change that? Well, we have to do it by being willing to bring things to the patient's uh, recognition, bring it in front of them. But we think, you know, as practitioners, many times that's way too simple, just to show lifestyle and diet. And 
for me, I think one of the excellent examples of this is Dr. Lee in 1948 talked about the methyl group. You know, we all sometimes stop and think, God, this is too simple. We need to we need to really break it down and look at it. Well, in 1948, when Dr. Lee brought up the methyl group, he points out that it's a vitamin B metabolism issue and a folic acid issue. And where does that start? Well, where do you lose uh, your ability to absorb vitamin B and fatty acids? Well, it starts with digestion. It starts with sugar handling. It starts with liver biliary problems. Those are the foundational issues, and that happens with a poor lifestyle and diet. That's truly the reality. Uh, degenerative disease, as we know it today, if you want to track the consumption of sugar to the consumption of, of refine, all these refined carbohydrates from the last century to today, you're going to see a parallel line of degenerative disease. It wasn't known the same cancer and heart disease and diabetes the way it is today, a hundred years ago. And so, what do we do? Why do we run away from this? No, we don't. I don't think so. Uh, we do it by bringing a sound approach. And today, what we're talking about is these tools in that approach. In 1994, the foundation started showing and teaching this course, uh, the CCN, uh, or CCWFN course in whole food nutrition to help practitioners understand. We went to school to, to get people well and to make a difference in people's lives. And you can't do that unless you bring both the things together, and that's helping people to understand why it happened and helping them understand the difference they can make in their own lives and the quality of their lives by understanding digestion, understanding how their body gets out of balance, understanding how that dessert night after night and those refined carbohydrates upset the body chemistry. So let's look at some of the clinical tools and the approach. You know, if we were taking our car to a mechanic, we don't want to, or a carpenter, we don't want to take it to somebody that doesn't have the appropriate tools. You can't expect to time a car with a flashlight. You can't expect to build cabinets with a chainsaw. So we need to have these tools, and these tools are pretty simple and very efficient, and they were very used constantly 50 years ago. So hopefully today we're going to encourage you to make a few changes, uh, get some different insights in how to be more efficient, and also help you to collect that data that is good, sound, verifiable data that consistently doesn't cost the patient or you a whole lot. Those tools, you'll realize, will give you some in-depth answers. And one of the first things that we're going to look at is probably some of you have heard about the nutritional exam. The nutritional exam, which we teach in the course, and unfortunately a lot of people want to make that the whole course, is the physical exam that was taught in the 40s and 50s. It was taught in medical schools. Because why? Because they thought at that time that function was more important, and they didn't take that allopathic approach that the pharmaceuticals have pushed on us to look at them. Those tools really don't cost much, uh, like I said. Uh, they're simple and if they are very efficient, but you need your patients to understand why you're doing things. One of the biggest questions uh, the, or I should say biggest complaints that patients have is my doctor doesn't listen to me. And they move from practice to practice many times 
We've all had somebody walk in the door and tell you, start telling you all the things the last guy did wrong. Well, that can change if you take the time to learn these tools, apply it with the nutritional exam, and put it together in an efficient manner. And that happens, like I said, uh, when you start looking at how to do this. And we're going to show you. Dr. Lee recommended that the first thing that you should be doing when you look at a patient walks in the door is he said use the questionnaire. Use the symptom survey questionnaire or today the system survey questionnaire. But in all the old texts, it's still the symptom survey questionnaire. Check the weight and height of your patient. Check their blood pressure and pulse. Do a tissue calcium test. Check their, uh, uh, do a uh, uh, iodine test and zinc test. Take saliva, urine. Uh, so why is he recommending these things? Because it's going to give you quick, easy answers, and it's going to make it simple. The palpation points that you'll learn in the nutritional exam are simple. You can do a whole complete nutritional exam in less than five minutes. So it isn't that big a thing. Tools that you'll need for doing that is, of course, the symptom survey questionnaire. But I recommend getting the software. Um, it's only $195, but it's going to be so much faster. Uh, get a medical set of scales that you can check height and weight. It's going to help you get uh, good answers on following up on the patient. Let's face it, more patients are interested in losing weight than they are of getting healthy. So. Take advantage of that. Use a mechanical, uh, a good stethoscope, I should say, and a uh, blood pressure cuff, not an electric one. But if you don't have any choice, use an electric one first and then start get the other. Use a pin light, pH paper, zinc test. You can get it from uh, uh, the liquid from standard process. Bottle of iodine to do the uh, uh, patch test. This information is in the back of your clinical reference guide. Uh, but thermometer, uh, tongue depressor, and be sure you have some good clinical tools and our reference material for it. And there's some books that I would recommend. The Therapeutic Food Manual and the Product Bullet I would recommend because, and you'll find those on our website as well, because the Therapeutic Food Manual is really talking about disease in pathology. That's what a patient walks in the door. Most of them are complaining about. It'll give you not a protocol, but it also explains to you what the, the clinical signs, what the signs and symptoms would be, what areas of, you would approach. And then at the very end, it recommends the support. The same thing with the symptom survey manual. Uh, mastering nutrition with the symptom survey. It, to me, it's one of the most important tools because it breaks it into systems and you start understanding how the body and what those signs and symptoms are. Last week, I was at a seminar on uh, hormonal issues, and I was just really surprised where the uh, speaker kept repeatedly talking about certain signs and symptoms, saying, well, this is a hypothyroid issue, and they weren't. It was a digestive issue, or it was a liver issue or a biliary issue. And, and if you start understanding those relationships, if you share it with your patient, the patient grows. The patient becomes a good patient. The clinical, uh, or excuse me, the product bulletin is a, really kind of the areas of uh, the core products of standard process. And when you look at it, you'll find that there's maybe a paragraph on the product and then a page and a half to two pages on why you're going to be using it. Again, from a, a functional base. All those books that look at it are functional base. Of course, there's the clinical reference guide, which is John Courtney's beautiful way of telling people how Dr. Lee put together products, which is a great uh, book. And you just don't want to give it to your spouse because whatever you gave them is never going to be right. But when they read what John Courtney said, your questions on 
why you aren't understanding these things better. Uh, Blood Kim manual and one of my favorite old manuals is uh, Vitamin News because when we talk about nutrition, what happens? Over and over again, what I find is people go, well, where's the data? Where's, you know, the skeptics? They want to know, where, where's the proof? Well, at one time, those observations were the proof, you know? Empirical data was the way we looked at things. But unfortunately, in the 40s, uh, the pharmaceuticals and the FDA decided that there would be a new form, the scientific way of doing research using animals. It's interesting because Dr. Lee points out in the 50s where if you do a digestive study with uh, um, mice or rats, that they have a different enzyme that when they eat uh, uh, foods that are processed, like we are just talking about, that they can actually digest them in a very efficient manner where people don't produce that enzyme. JAMA, uh, um, in a report, what, about three months ago, uh, recommended or made the comment, or the article was talking about how we really need to rethink using for mice and rats uh, uh, for a, doing a study of uh, digestion because there's an enzyme that's different. Sixty, what, six, sixty-seven years later, we're, we're finally figuring this out. Why did that information disappear? How did it disappear? And that's what Vitamin News does. It's just it's it's got tons of reference when they use food. And one of the things that, of course, is my favorite part about that particular book is that if you haven't looked at it or if you haven't gotten one, uh, get one because I used to love it, but you could now that you can actually index everything and find it is it's just it's got all these little pearls in it that are just wonderful to share with your patients and and really helps you understand as well. Uh, but we had we'd been working on that book for about three years trying to collect because it was one of the books that was ordered destroyed uh, and when Dr. Lee lost his case. And I had three pages that I couldn't find and they were all reference pages. And one of the old timers uh, uh, that used to help us and mentor us and uh, called and he said, John, when are you going to get that book finished? And I said, well, as soon as I can, but, you know, we can't find these three pages and maybe I'm going to have to produce it and uh, put it together without it. And he goes, what pages? And I told him, and he goes, oh, I think I might know somebody. Now, this guy was a fr good friend of Dr. Lee's, and he had gone through several of the FDA raids that they had problems with. And amazingly, in two weeks, I received an unmarked envelope. Uh, the only thing I could tell is look at the stamp and the stamp on it from the post office where it was from, which happened to be the same town. So I called him up and I said, Al, thank you. I appreciate it. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. If we hadn't have had that phone call, I probably wouldn't have had those three pages. And he was dead three months later. Uh, so those are the type of people that made the foundation happen. Didn't mean to get off on that story, but uh, it just was one of those wonderful moments. So let's look at the questionnaire and see uh, how we can use it and how it's going to benefit us the, uh, the most. So first off, uh, uh, when we think of the questionnaire, most of us think about it as a way to get a protocol. But I want you to think about that questionnaire, the symptom survey questionnaire, as a way to really look at how you're going to manage your patient or a tool to manage your patient. And again, uh, as I said, the complaint, what's the first complaint from the patient? My doctor doesn't listen to me. So you and your staff, your number one concern really needs to be uh, that you're listening to your patient. And their, this tool, I should say, this questionnaire, is probably one of the fastest ways to turn that whole concept around. There's about 
Well, there's two new there's two uh, questionnaires now. The, the original Dr. Lee's questionnaire was 224 questions. The new one's I think 212. But the old one has the really the meaty questions in it. And it doesn't look at pathology and disease, especially if you use the software. And the software has the ability of doing multiple ca calculations. Actually, Nutritech, which the foundation has, is uh, uh, I think will do over 2,400 oh. calculations. Mm. So focus uh, on those underlying issues. That's what we want to do. And you want the patient to know when you hand that pa that questionnaire, uh, whether it's you or your staff, that it's important for you. It's Im if your staff's handing out, they need to be saying, you know, this is an important tool for the doctor to be able to look at and be able to get this information. So when you come back, he can go ahead and design a, a program with the data that's been collected. <laughs> that's personally tailored for your needs. Those symptoms aren't the patient's enemy. They are going to start understanding that they're really their friend. You know, when we talk about cancer today, and if you look at the medical model, what if a tumor is, a, you know, your enemy? But it isn't. That's your body's ability to really take those cancer cells, those mutated cells and start collecting them, trying to help you. Unfortunately, you know, patients don't understand. And the model of allopathic medicine makes those signs and symptoms your enemy, and they aren't. The patient needs to know. When you start relating those signs and symptoms with the exam and being able to put it together, they will understand why and what the problem is. It's not a problem of disease. It's a problem of function. We don't have disease without the lack of function. We don't have disease without toxicity. Why has the body changed? It changed because we've created it. That's what our patients have to understand. This questionnaire is a great way to get a history. It's been used since 1939. Dr. Lee and Dr. Page actually put it together and, and collaborated on it. It's, you know, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of practitioners have used it through the years. And so make it a tool that you're using. Run it on the first time of every time you see a patient. Mm -hmm. Uh, excuse me, run it on the first patient you see every time. Uh, uh, when you see them, any new patient. Uh, um, I like the questionnaire for two reasons. And I, the software, I, let me go into it a little bit more. The software actually does something that I find very interesting and very good. Uh, it those, when I handed out those questionnaires, there is a section that has five questions on what are those most important symptoms that do bother you. And that the, you ask the patient to look over the questions, read each one thoroughly, and answer accordingly, and put in any comments that they would like or any issues that they might have. Well, if you use the software, it will bring out a primary and secondary group, and it lists those questions that the patient has listed. It also lists those five areas of concern. So you would have those, and you're able to start relating and asking them about those questions. You're not only collecting good history and data with that, but you're also answering the question of the patient that you are listening. You're showing them that they're of your concern. After all, they have spent time and energy uh, going through that. So you need to spend some time and energy helping them understand why they had those questions. To me, that was the perfect opening. So whether you're a chiropractor, or a acupuncturist, nurse practitioner, uh, MD, uh, DO, you know, it doesn't make any difference. Those questions are important for the patient, and especially 
if you think about it under the medical model, of most of the time you're running blood chem panels first, that really looks at that bell curve, that 95% of the time the patients are walking around completely healthy until they all of a sudden have it, whatever it is. But yet they've been living with these signs and symptoms probably for years. Uh, so help them to understand that this, this isn't normal. This is a functional issue. And we're working with health. We're not working with disease. It also will give you a scoring sheet that looks at not only the marks that they put down, how many, what level of problems that they have, but it also analyzes those and shows you the areas of concern that you would want to be looking at and what those base causes are and makes a recommendation. One of the other things we talked about is properly using a stethoscope and medical scale. Uh, we're going to be going into that farther in, uh, the, with Dr. Caldwell, but I want to point out to you, if you're not taking a blood pressure and pulse from the patient and you're using whole foods, think about it. If you're using, uh, let's say, Cataplex G or B, one's a vasodilator, one's a vasoconstrictor. Cardio Plus, for instance, that has a G that isn't necessarily a cardiovascular, it's very helpful helpful with cardiovascular things, but it also is a detoxifier because the G opens up those veins and arteries, uh, helps the blood flow. The cataplex E2 helps oxygen to get into the system. The cardiotrophin helps the bottom of the heart actually contract stronger and pushes more blood flow through the system and opening up the liver a little faster. And the cataplex C is going to support the adrenals and bring more oxygen. Why wouldn't you want blood pressure and pulse? Because with blood pressure and pulse, there's a whole range of uh, products that would work, but that would work better if you use that with under the understanding of what the pulse and the blood, excuse me, and the blood pressure is. And the software will do that automatically for you. So, you know, your patients expect it. Do it. It also, if you're weighing your patients and taking their heights, the software is going to also do a BMI, which is another helpful tool. You know, we forget that we're not just looking for that protocol. One of the nice things that I always like about the, the software, and especially from a practice management standpoint, is depending on the questions that they ask, depending on how you use, uh, um, or excuse me, the questions or uh, the number of questions, it'll recommend the toxicity questionnaire. The toxicity questionnaire, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, is a questionnaire that the patient actually fills out themselves and scores the sheet. I always loved it because when you were collecting your data, you could take that and then go ahead and hand it to the patient, say, pointing out that the computer, allowing you to be the second opinion, had recommended this. Could they please fill it out and bring it back for their report of findings, which was always two to five days later? Think about it. The patient has taken it home. They have filled it out. They have read what they put down. They understand whether they got what type of score they got, and they come back. Is your job changed? Has your relationship with that patient not changed? And you haven't had to do anything. You haven't said anything except for handed them the toxicity questionnaire, pointed out that it came from the computer, and that you really wanted to see what they were going to do and please fill it out, bring it back, because it was going to help you support them better. That's a no-brainer. It's simple. And it's something that you shouldn't even be thinking about uh, when you go ahead and talk to that patient. Lastly, one of the things that I love with, about the software, uh, uh, again, and I don't want to sound like I'm selling to it, but... For a lot of people, when they're starting out, they don't 
they don't really know, they're not sure about the questions or what the recommendations are. And I don't like the idea of not knowing why because what we're trying to tell you is you need to know the why. If you know the why, the patient will change and support what you're doing in a whole different light. So by simply taking your cursor and putting it on the, the product recommendation and double-clicking it, you have a whole list of clinical information right there. It's going to help you understand why you're offering uh, those things, and it'll help you understand uh, uh, why it's best to use maybe one product over another in supporting uh, that patient. The survey itself does a lot of things, but, you know, that isn't really the biggest important part of about it today. Today we're talking about using it to benefit your patients and to control the patient a little differently. It tracks and gives you a pre and a post because, to me, when you're sitting there down the road 60 days, most of the time the patient's starting to feel, uh, you know, they're feeling a lot better. They're doing it. And all of a sudden they decide that it's not really helping them that much. When you can go ahead and go back to that information and show that they've lost five pounds or maybe that they, uh, uh, blood pressure went down or that whatever it is, that data, that clinical data that you collected is going to make a big difference. And it's going to help you show the patient their path that they're going to have to take. Let's face it. The first 90 days of a new patient is going to make the difference of a long-term relationship or a very short relationship. And how you handle that data and collect that data is so important. Now, some of you might be muscle testers. Some of you don't muscle test or don't want to muscle test. I just need to, I want to put this out. Uh, I use muscle testing, but I used all of what I'm talking about and what we'll be talking about in this series. And I did it because there was things that muscle testing showed me that I would have never bought, picked up otherwise, a root canal problem or something. But I never felt that it was valuable to me or to the patient to use one modality to gather all my information. There's things that I would have never found out muscle testing that if I hadn't done the other clinical tests and collected the other clinical data first. So if you do use muscle testing, combine it. Make it part of it. You can maybe do, you know, uh, uh, break it up into parts so the patient understands what they are. But make sure that you're going ahead and putting that together. Because that's what Dr. Lee recommended. He wanted you to take that blood pressure. He wanted you to take that weight and height. He wanted you to know what the uh, pulse rate is. He wanted to know what the pH is. He wanted to know why. And he wanted you to put, use that information to make uh, a better decision on how you're going to support the patient. We don't have to recreate the wheel. We don't have to do anything really abnormally uh, different. Uh, medical questionnaires uh, ask for family history. This is a good way to have, get that family history. This is a good way to get those issues and bring them out what they are. Uh, so let's use that. Uh, it doesn't cost much. The practitioners of today that are using a functional approach, a foundational approach, looking at that root cause are going to be the people to me that are going to be around a lot longer. We watch costs just skyrocketing. They don't have to. If the patient <coughs> understands why it's happening, we're working in a different paradigm. We're working with health. We're working with prevention. We're not working with that disease model, and that patient needs to understand that disease model is not part of what they started out life with. 